Howdy. So what have we learned so far? We've learned that gases are mostly empty space. And because of that, intermolecular forces are typically negligible between gas particles, and the volume of the gas particles themselves are negligible. We've learned that we can use the ideal gas law to calculate macroscopic properties of gases under common conditions. We've learned that the ideal gas law is not accurate when the pressure is too high because we have too many gas particles and the volume of the gas particles themselves is no longer negligible, or the temperature is too low because intermolecular forces start being important. We've learned that we can use ideal gas law to derive an equation for the density of a gas and to derive Dalton's law of partial pressures. This video is on applications of the ideal gas law. And it's important because we can use the ideal gas law to convert from amount of gas to the moles. And hence, we can actually use the ideal gas law to determine how much product was produced or reactant was consumed. After watching this video, you should be able to convert from moles to volume of gas particles and vice versa. And given how much reactant was consumed, you should be able to determine how much product was produced and vice versa. And so if we look at this reaction, we have N2 going plus 3H2 going to 2 moles of ammonia. Now you should remember that a reaction is just a recipe. Okay, The reaction does not tell us how much of the stuff we have, just tells you what ratio we need. And so this reaction tells us that for every 1 mole of a nitrogen, we need 3 moles of hydrogen, and we'd form 2 moles of ammonia if the reaction goes to completion. And so the question is, if one mole of nitrogen and three moles of hydrogen were put in a sealed container and react, will the pressure in the container increase or decrease? And so we're assuming that this reaction goes to completion, and so all the reactants are converted into products. Now remember for ideal gas law, the identity of the particles doesn't matter. All that matters is the number of particles. And so we start with four moles, and we'd end with two moles, so that means that the pressure should go down. The pressure after the reaction should be half the pressure before the reaction. And again, according to ideal gas law, the um, identity of the gas does not matter. All that matters is the number of particles. So we can look at this, another reaction. This is propane plus oxygen going to CO2 plus water vapor. And so for every one mole of propane, we need five moles of oxygen and we'd form three moles of CO2 and four moles of water. In the combustion of propane, a single propane molecule reacts with five molecules of O2 to produce three molecules of carbon dioxide and four molecules of water. And so if you had two moles of propane, how many moles of oxygen gas would you need to completely react with the propane? Now again, the reaction is only a recipe, doesn't tell you how much you got. And so we can actually use the reaction to, get to determine this fraction. And so the fraction here says that we need five moles of O2 for every one mole of propane. This is from the reaction. The question tells us we have two moles of the propane. Now I put the moles of the propane on the bottom here, so it will cancel the moles of the propane on top here. And so two times five gives us 10 moles of O2. And so we'd need 10 moles of O2. If the reaction went into completion, how much volume would the products take up at STP? Remember, STP stands for standard temperature and pressure. It means one atmosphere of pressure and temperature of zero degrees Celsius, which corresponds to 273 Kelvin. And so you should remember that uh, ideal, one mole of an ideal gas takes up 22.4 liters of volume at STP. And so we had two moles of the propane, and this gives us the number of products. Notice that the question is, you know, how much volume would the products take up? And so we have three plus four, seven moles of products versus every one mole of propane. And so again, this fraction came from the reaction. Now we know that one mole of gas gives us 22.4 liters at STP. And so the moles of propane canceled moles of propane, moles of products canceled moles of products. And so then we're left with liters. And so 2 times 7 is 14, times 22.4 gives us 313.6 liters of gas. And so it's kind of cool. Ideal gas law enables us to actually determine how much gas would be produced. Now here's another example. This is electrolysis of water. The decomposition of water is thermodynamically disfavored, but can be made to occur by electrolysis, the application of an external electric current. 
Here, platinum electrodes transfer electrons between two cell compartments to separate the decomposition products. Gaseous oxygen rises from the anode at the left, hydrogen from the cathode at the right. And so it's kind of cool. If you look at it, you know, from the reaction, for every two moles of water that we um, de decompose, we're going to get two moles of H2, one mole of O2. And so we're producing the H2 twice as fast as the O2. And so we should produce twice as much H2 as O2. And if we look here, we have twice as much H2 as we have O2. And so if four moles of hydrogen was formed, how many moles of oxygen must have been formed? And so again, we're going to use the reaction to give us this fraction. And so according to this fraction, we'll get one mole of O2 for every two moles of H2. Now we started with four moles of H2. Now you can put this fraction either way, but because we have four moles of H2, we put the moles of H2 on the bottom. And so these, those cancel. Four divided by two is two. And so that leaves us with two moles of O2. And so watching your units is very, very important. You should always pay attention to your units. If 12 liters of hydrogen was formed, how many liters of oxygen must have been formed? Well, again, according to ideal gas law, all that matters is the number of gas particles and, and um, the volume is directly proportional to N. Everything else is held constant. And so according to this reaction, it says two moles of H2 gives us one mole of O2. Well, you can also imagine that two liters of H2 correspond to one liter of O2. And so this fraction, again, this fraction comes from the reaction. And so 12 liters of H2 cancel liters of H2. And so we end up with six liters of O2. Kind of cool. So if 22.4 liters of, of hydrogen were formed at STP, how many moles of oxygen must have been formed? And so again, remember STP is standard temperature and pressure, zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure. And so we're starting with 22.4 liters of H2. This was given the problem. Now we know that for one mole of an ideal gas at STP, that corresponds to 22.4 liters of H2. And so we're gonna put the liters on the bottom here so they cancel with the liters of H2. And from the reaction, for every two moles of H2 form, we get one mole of O2. And so the moles of H2 cancel. And so 22.4 divided by 22.4 divided by two gives us 0.5 moles of O2. And so kind of cool, we can always go between volume and moles. And then we use the reaction to determine from moles of one thing to moles of another thing. In this reaction, a single molecule of phosphorus, P4, reacts with six molecules of Cl2, chlorine, to produce four molecules of phosphorus trichloride. The flask contains 0 0.06 moles of chlorine gas. Into it, we put 0 0.01 moles of phosphorus. The elements react breaking the bonds that link the atoms and forming new ones to create phosphorus trichloride. And so we got a cool reaction. And so you can imagine if we had 0.1 mole of the phosphorus, you know, how many moles of the chlorine would we need? Well, we should need six times more. So the reaction is always in terms of moles. And so we need six times more, so that would be 0 0.06. And then the question would be, how many moles of phosphorus trichloride would be formed. And so according to the reaction, we can go from one of the, um, the phosphorus to four of the phosphorus trichloride. And so we should need, we should form 0 0.04 moles of the phosphorus trichloride. In a collision involving a car equipped with airbags, the impact initiates a chemical reaction. Automobile airbags work when a sample of sodium azide detonates, producing nitrogen gas. This gas fills the bag. Using our understanding of the gas laws, we can calculate the quantity of sodium azide required to produce the appropriate amount of nitrogen gas. An airbag is a rapidly inflating cushion that helps to prevent auto crash injuries. 
When there is a sudden deceleration of the auto, a switch is thrown which triggers the start of a chemical reaction that produces a gas. The chemical reaction employed is the thermal decomposition of sodium azide, NaN3. Upon heating, sodium azide decomposes rapidly to form sodium metal and nitrogen gas. The reaction is exothermic and rapid once it has begun. In practice, an oxidant is added to react with the sodium to form sodium oxide. When the reaction is triggered by a sudden application of heat, the hot nitrogen gas formed by decomposition of the sodium azide expands into the airbag. Expansion occurs in only about 50 milliseconds. After the initial expansion, the hot nitrogen gas cools and the bag partially deflates, freeing the passenger. Notice that no new substance has been introduced into this closed system during reaction. The large volume difference between reactants and products is due to the fact that one of the products is a gas. And so really important, there actually was done a lot of research in making the airbag and making sure that it inflated fast enough that saved people's lives, but not so fast that it actually injured people. And so an interesting question would be, how many grams of sodium azide is needed to make the airbag inflate to 60 liters? at one atmosphere and zero degrees Celsius. And so here's the reaction for the sodium azide decomposing as sodium plus nitrogen. Again, remember in practice that we react something with the sodium because sodium metal by itself is actually very reactive. And so we can break it down in a series of steps. We could determine the number of moles that we need. And then from the moles of N2, we could determine the moles of sodium azide. And then from the moles of sodium azide, we can actually determine the mass of the sodium azide. And so from the moles, we could use PV equals NRT. Um, we could also just remember that 22.4 liters per mole at STP, and so 60 divided by 22.4 should also give us the 2.678. So either way, PV equals NRT, or remembering that at STP, one mole corresponds to 22.4 liters. And so we determined we need 2.678 moles of N2. Now, to determine the moles of the sodium azide, we look at our reaction and we see that for every three moles of nitrogen, we need two moles of the sodium azide. And again, we'll put the moles of nitrogen on the bottom and some moles of nitrogen cancel the moles of nitrogen and we left with the moles of sodium azide. And so we need 1.786 moles of the sodium azide. Now we determine need to determine how much mass that corresponds to. And so we can calculate the molar mass for the sodium azide. And so from the periodic table, the atomic mass of sodium is 23. Atomic mass of nitrogen is 14. Three times 14 is 42 plus 23. Gives us 65 grams per mole for the sodium azide. And so 1.786 moles of sodium azide times 65 grams over moles of sodium azide. And so the moles of sodium azide cancel, and that gives us 116 grams of sodium azide. And so that's how many grams of sodium azide we'd need to inflate the bag to 60 liters. We can look at another um, reaction. And so calcium carbonate carbide with water forms um, calcium hydroxide plus acetylene. And so the question is, how many liters of acetylene is produced when 20 grams of calcium carbide is reacted with excess water at 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere? And so we'll have to determine the moles of the calcium carbide. And then from the moles of the calcium carbide, we can determine moles of the um, ac acetylene from the reaction. And then moles of acetylene, we can actually determine the volume using PV, PV equals NRT. And so to determine the moles of the calcium carbide, we determine the molar mass. And so calcium, periodic table, says it's 40 grams per mole. Carbon is 12. 2 times 12 is 24 plus 40. Gives us 64 grams per mole. And so we start with 20 grams. We put the 64 grams calcium carbide in the bottom so that they cancel. And so that will correspond to one mole of the calcium carbide. And so 20 divided by 64 gives us 0.3125 moles of the calcium carbide. Now we use the reaction to determine the moles of the acetylene. 
And so for each one mole of calcium carbide that reacts, we form one mole of acetylene. And so that gives us 0.3125 moles of acetylene. And now we need to determine the volume. And so PV equals NRT. We divide both sides by P. That gives us V equals NRT over P. Plug in our numbers, 0.3125 moles of the acetylene. Um, for the gas constant, remember, there's five different gas constants that differ just based on units. Now, we're told that we're at one atmosphere, and so that's our pressure. And so we're using the gas constant as ATM. And then our temperature always has to be in Kelvin. Remember to go from Celsius to Kelvin, we add 273. And so atmospheres cancel atmospheres, moles cancel moles, Kelvin cancels Kelvin, and we're left with liters. We multiply it out and we see that we get 7.64 liters of the acetylene. We can look at another reaction. And so ammonium nitrate plus water goes to nitrogen gas plus hydrogen, um, sorry, plus water vapor plus oxygen gas. On the left, a mixture of ammonium nitrate and zinc dust. On the right, water. A few drops initiate an explosive decomposition of the ammonium nitrate that generates a gaseous mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, and water vapor. The total pressure of the gas mixture is the sum of its components' partial pressures. So we can actually ask a, a, a number of questions about this. Um, which product will be have the highest partial pressure? Remember from Dalton's law, the total pressure is equal to some of the partial pressures. And so from this reaction, we're producing mostly the majority is water vapor. And so it should have the highest partial pressure. Which product will have the lowest partial pressure? And so that should be the O2. And again, we got that from the reactions. And remember, ideal gas law says that all that really matters is the, is the number of particles, not the identity of the particles. So if two moles of ammonium nitrate reacted in a 22.4 liter container, what would be the partial pressures of the nitrogen formed at um, 273 Kelvin? And so this is kind of interesting. Um, we're at zero degrees Celsius. And so one mole should give us 22.4 liters at one atmosphere. Now we're at our container size is 22.4 and we have two moles. And so that means the pressure should be two atmospheres. And that's because we're going from two of these, two of those, so we're gonna have two moles of nitrogen. And again, one mole would give us 22.4 liters. So two moles, if the volume constraint should give us two atmospheres of pressure. What would be the partial pressure of the water vapor formed? And so we got the partial pressure of the nitrogen is two. For the water vapor, um, it should be three times bigger. And so that should be six atmospheres. What would be the partial pressure of the oxygen? And so two, it should be half. And so that should be one atmosphere. What would be the total pressure at 22.4 liter container? And so remember, the total pressure is just equal to some of the partial pressures. And so we have two plus six plus one, and so that gives us nine atmospheres of pressure. And so ideal gas law, it's important, it enables us to actually calculate macroscopic properties of gases. Also enables us to convert from volume to number of moles. I hope that was helpful.